Ephesians chapter 6. Let's pray. Father in heaven, almighty God, thank you for your presence here today. Thank you, Lord God, for your words to us. Lord, thank you for the encouragement. Lord, as you draw us to yourself, Lord, we want to fulfill your purpose. We want you to work in our hearts and to bring glory to your name. Bless your word now, Lord, to our hearts. Glorify your name, Lord. As we go into your word, Lord, we pray that you give us wisdom, discernment, understanding. And Lord, we pray for your anointing, that your word would minister to our hearts and that we would glorify your name. Give us strategy, Lord, as to how to defeat the works of darkness in our lives, in our church, in our land. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything to stand, stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, and pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the saints. Amen. Last week we looked at the whole matter of the demonic forces that are arrayed against us. And uh, we examined very briefly the four demonic authorities or spiritual beings, intelligent spiritual beings that are set up against the Christian. Now, these four are not the whole hierarchy of Satan. Paul elsewhere refers to other beings. He refers to powers, using a different word, and he refers to dominions. He refers to thrones. And in these references, he refers not to just um, abstract concepts, but he refers to them as if they are personalities, spiritual beings that are working in the hierarchy of Satan to achieve specific objectives. Now it is really impossible to define the role precisely of each of these spirit beings. And it's not really necessary. We have some general, general ideas. And uh, the ideas that we have from scripture give us enough information to know that Satan's kingdom is organized and he has strategy. Say the word strategy for me, please. Strategy. And so to defeat Satan, we must also have strategy. And our strategy comes not from studying the organization of the kingdom of darkness so much as from looking at the revelation in the word of God as to how to fight spiritual warfare. In fact, in fighting spiritual warfare, we'll not understand all that happens in the spirit world. We'll not understand the detailed mechanisms. But how many of you know that you don't need to know how a car engine works to drive a car? Aren't you glad for that? 
Amen. How many of you know you don't have to know um, computer engineering to use a computer? Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Same, similarly, you don't need to know the detailed mechanisms of spiritual um, warfare in order to overcome and win the war. Okay, if I have an M16, I don't need to know the technology of how the M16 is built in order to fire it effectively. I might need to know how to clean it and keep it in shape. Amen? But I don't need to know the history of how the M16 developed and what the mechanisms are for it to work. I don't need to know all those details. I just need to know how to use it. And sometimes we make the mistake of being preoccupied with detailed mechanisms and not using the tools that God gave us. Hello? Sometimes we get preoccupied with the deep secrets of Satan when you don't need to know the deep secrets of Satan. And so you're casting out a demon and demon start telling you some deep things. And you say, hey, I saw it go for true. What? And you are so fascinated and you entertain the demonic spirits. But let me tell you something, demonic spirits are lying spirits. And so they'll tell you some truth and mix it with lies to send you on a wrong track. Amen? And so don't get your information on how to fight spiritual warfare from demons. Hello? Don't make no sense. They're not going to tell you the, the things that you really need to know, are they? They're going to send you on a wrong track because they're deceiving spirits. It's like years ago, brother was casting out a demon and, you know, they said, Spirit, what is your name? And the, the demon answered something like that. And the guy said, you lying spirit, are you telling the truth? <laughs> no, you can't depend on demons. You know, I've, I've read books that have been very interesting, I must tell you, very interesting about demonic operations and people who were, were witches and lodge members and, 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 and satanists. They come to know the Lord and they, they write books about how Satan's kingdom works and the different incantations they use to achieve this and that and how they were doing this and that. And it's very interesting, you know, brethren. And nothing wrong with reading books like that. But don't depend for your information on demonic sources. You understand? Because Satan's kingdom is diverse, it is based on deception, and what the large people do might be different from what the Satanists do, might be different from what the cultists do, right? And, you know, if you hit, hitch on to one system and say, boy, this is how Satan always works, you might be totally oblivious to when him hit you with another system. He has a variety of means and methods, amen? Are you following me now, brethren? So we are to, to depend on the Word of God. And God tells us all that we need to know to be victorious. So, in Ephesians chapter 6, we are told that if we are going to fight effectively, we must be clothed with the armor of God. The armor of God. Paul had said, look, you must be strong in the Lord. It is the Lord's strength, his power. You must be empowered by God so that you may be able to stand against the devil's schemes and stand in the evil day. Would you say that we are now in an evil day? Is this an evil day? Do we need to stand firm on the, with, with, the, with the armor of God now, today? More than ever. Amen, brethren? It's amazing. The film that we saw was um, yesterday was produced in 1971 and the conditions it described in Jamaica the social conditions have gotten much much worse in 20 odd nearly 30 years and so we need to understand that what we are up against now today is much more severe we need to be to be even more village vigilant than ever before because Satan is on the war path, and we also have to be on the war path for God. But we don't fight with the weapons of this world. 
We fight with spiritual weapons that are powerful to the, the tearing down of strongholds, the Bible says. And the scriptures teach us about the armor of God. And the armor says a number of things to us. The armor is a set of conditions, life conditions, that God wants to establish in us. These conditions prevent Satan from working in our lives. They prevent us from giving place to the devil. But they also enable God to work in our lives. What is the armor? Let's go through them quickly. First of all, it says we must have the belt of truth. Paul was probably looking at the Roman soldier and how he was, he was attired for war. And he was drawing parallels and analogies by the Spirit of God with our spiritual battle. Incidentally, we're going to go back to Isaiah 59 later on. Isaiah 59 formed a model for Paul in thinking about the armor. And the Spirit of God led him to elaborate as he considered the typical dress of a Roman soldier. God is the one who first takes on his armor in Isaiah 59. He's the one who clothes himself with the breastplate of righteousness and the helmet of salvation. But Paul elaborates on this, and he says, you know, you have different aspects of the armor. Here are some of the items. One, truth. What does it mean by the belt of truth? The belt was something that gave stability to the soldier, that gave them stability and balance. And so it was something like a... a, a, a a thick band around the waist. Truth provides that stability for us. But what is truth? Truth has to do with two aspects. One, sincerity, lack of hypocrisy. Some people believe that this truth being emphasized here has to do with the fact that you are sincere in your devotion to God. You are a person with a pure conscience. You avoid hypocrisy and pretense. You are genuine, the authentic stuff. Truth. That makes sense because Satan likes deception. He likes anything that has to do with darkness. He likes schemes. He doesn't come straight. He likes to deceive. But there's another aspect of truth that is possible here. The Word of God is truth. And the doctrines of the faith, the beliefs that we hold from the Word of God are the truth. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And he gives us a body of beliefs that are called the truth. So the two aspects, we're not sure which one Paul had in mind primarily. It could be the ter in terms of sincerity because he didn't use the article the. And normally when it talks about doctrine, it says the truth. But I want to apply it to both to make sure that we cover all possibilities. It can mean doctrinal purity, and it can mean sincerity, honesty, lack of hypocrisy. Are you with me now, brethren? Those things protect us, give us stability in the war against Satan. We are not driven back and fro by every wind of doctrine. It's not everything you hear upon TV. It's not everything you read in books that are the truth. You have to measure everything you hear, everything you receive by the Word of God. Amen? The Scriptures, which means that you must be familiar with the Word of God and be able to use the Word to evaluate these things that we hear. Amen. Everything we hear, every message that is preached, if we have a guest speaker coming in here and speaking, he has to be evaluated by the Word of God. And the Spirit of God in you can discern truth from error. Am I right? Amen. Any one of us as leaders who share from, from this position, you are to evaluate against the Word of God. You have that personal responsibility. And I say that because many people abdicate their responsibility and depend on their leaders so much that they believe that these leaders must tell them everything and that they must not judge or discern for themselves. This is not right. Amen? That's what cults are made of. Jim Jones had a following. Jim Jones, in, who, who famous for the, the whole uh, disaster in Guyana, 
he started out as a Holy Ghost charismatic preacher, full of love and enough good works. Many people followed him, and he had so many gifts. He had a healing ministry, prayed for the sick, and they were healed. And many people followed him, and they began to say that this man must be a prophet of God. He must be more than a prophet of God. And eventually he began to promote himself as, as, as divine. And people followed him. He decided that his people must leave United States and, and form a commune in, in, in the jungles of Guyana. And the people followed him. Who were the people that followed him? Intelligent people. People who had university degrees. Sensible people. Followed him into the jungles of Guyana. Eventually, he got this revelation that, you know, it was time for them to meet God. And so he mixed up a big brew. He was being attacked. I'm leaving out a lot of the story, but he was being attacked. And he felt threatened. And he said, you know what? All right, this is time now. Judgment. Armageddon. And it mixed up a big brew of purple poison liquid that looked like Kool-Aid. And how, how many people died in the Guyana Jonestown tragedy? How much? 400? 900. 900. No. Think about this, brethren. 900 people drinking poison lemonade. Children. Young people. Adults. Why they drinking it? Because this man that they follow blindly say yes, they must do it. Granted, he had his gunmen and thing, making sure that, that you got the revelation. <laughs> but it was one of the greatest tragedies. You understand what happened? People did not evaluate what this man was saying and doing based on the word of God. They began to take their minds off the word of God and to believe every word that this man said as if this man was God himself. It's easy to happen, you know. It's a spirit of deception. Instability is caused by our ignorance of the truth of God's word and our insincerity, hypocrisy, not facing reality. Because there were plenty of signs along the way that this man was off track. Plenty of signs, but people chose to ignore these signs. Signs like, for example, he felt that he had the right to have sex with anybody in his, in his fellowship. Right? Young or old, he had that divine right. But because of his giftings and his raw power and charisma, people ignored those things. People had questions, you know, they said, boy, this does not sound right. But when they look at them, see him dynamic charisma, they say, no. Is God this? So ignore the other things. Hallelujah. I think this is how the Holy Spirit wants us to see truth. The two aspects, they go together. Sincerity, lack of hypocrisy, genuineness with the truth of the revelation of God's message, the doctrinal truths that God has given us for the church age. They go together. Amen? Compromising one leads to compromising the other. And they work together like that. So the truth is the belt that keeps us in spiritual warfare. The truth of who we are in Christ. Our identity in Jesus Christ. Amen? The fact that we are children of the King. When Satan comes and brings accusation, we confess to him the truth of the Word of God. That we are sons and daughters of the living God. And there is therefore now no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus. Amen? Amen? We declare these things based on the word of God, the word of his truth. Amen? The next item of armor is the breastplate. It's the breastplate of righteousness. Again, Paul doesn't elaborate, but when we think of the word righteousness, the original Greek word means to be declared righteous, it means justification. It's speaking about our character as well as our condition. Our condition before God is that we are 
declared righteous. Turn to your neighbor and say it. We are declared righteous. This is justification. It means, it means that although we are sinners, God makes a judicial decree as judge he says you are free from sin I declare you righteous you are justified justified never sinned just as if I had never sinned amen he declares you righteous before God that's the righteousness of God, which is imputed, the Bible says, to us. So we have the righteousness of God imputed to us. Isn't that wonderful, brethren? I mean, our righteousness are as filthy rags. But when God gives us his righteousness, it is a free gift. And before him, we are declared righteous. We're not righteous by any works of our own, but we are declared righteous. Now, the second aspect of this righteousness is our character. Because we have the position of being declared righteous, we must let our character line up with what our position says. Amen? So righteousness is a breastplate. Breastplate protects your most sensitive organ or one of the most delicate and sensitive organs, your heart. Hallelujah. Righteousness of God protecting you from the attacks of Satan, protecting your heart, protecting your some vital organs there in the middle of your chest and all of that. And God wants us to walk in this righteousness. Righteousness in the confidence that he has declared us righteous. So when Satan comes with accusation, we can stand up and say, we are the righteousness of God in Christ but righteousness also in that we are committed to right living to right acts to living a life that pleases God to holiness amen the third item the shoes the boots the boots speak of the readiness to preach the gospel of peace the good news of peace with God and peace brethren this good news of peace the bible says how how lovely on the mountaintops are those that declare the good news the good news of god's gospel the gospel of peace peace with god and peace with with each other now that preparation the word readiness there implies that you are ready and, and waiting you are prepared to proclaim the gospel of peace are you prepared to preach the gospel brethren any circumstances are you in a position that you are able to give a, the, an answer to any man that asks you a reason for why you believe in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior that is what gives you that stability that's what gives you that grip on your on the ground that ability that preparation it means that you must be ready at all times to preach the gospel. It means that your life must measure up, but it also means that you must have the boldness and the confidence in what you believe, that when the situation arises, any opportunity you get at all, you are able to share the gospel of Jesus Christ without being ashamed of the gospel of Christ because it is the power of God unto salvation. Do you have that confidence in the gospel? as the power of God unto salvation? Do we really share the fact that Jesus is the answer to all the problems that we have in this country? All the problems that people have as personal problems. Is Jesus the answer? Do we have that confidence? Well, we must be ready to share the gospel in every situation. And that is part of our armor in fighting spiritual warfare. Next one. The shield of faith. And I like this one. I don't know why Paul says above all though. Taking the shield of faith. Perhaps he's trying to say that 
of the items this is the most important i don't know but the shield of faith speaks of well in the picture that he's painting a shield that covered your whole body it wasn't just a little thing on your hand it was a shield that was a full body length i'm told there are different greek words for the word shield and the one that is used is for a full length shield that covers your whole body now how they used to use this shield is that when the enemy came against you they would send shoot arrows with bows and arrows but the arrows were sometimes set ablaze so it was flaming arrows so here comes an arrow at you and there's a a, a, a a flame at the end of the arrow instead of a point there's a flame so that anything it touches catches a fire and the idea was to just burn up everything that can be burnt up so they shoot all of these these arrows at you and the soldiers what they do this they would take this full length shield and they would just come together close ranks and the shield would form a barrier like a wall and the arrows would hit into the shield the shield was covered with tar and as they hit into the shield they would be extinguished hallelujah you see what god is saying to us that's what faith does faith extinguishes the fiery darts the arrows that are ablaze at us you know when satan shoot an arrow at you you know the arrow is dangerous enough but you know what come with it fire and it's set ablaze it, it it when it when it takes root it catches a fire and it destroys everything that can be burnt but the bible is teaching us that our our answer to that is that we use our faith as a shield and we close ranks with each other and encourage each other to believe the word of god amen you see the ministry of encouragement and the faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of god so i'm going to apply this to us encouraging each other that we can apply our faith to believe god that his promises are true so when you feel lonely and abandoned we confess the word that we will not fear what man will do unto us because the lord says i am your helper i will never leave you nor forsake you and you hold on to that word amen so you confess the word of god and you let that word build faith in you and as you exercise faith he quenches god allows you to quench the fiery darts that are shot against you what are some of the darts that satan shoots against us doubt condemnation fear how you how you how you quench the, the dart of fear how do you do that you know one of the the strategies of the devil i have a couple of friends who like me are getting up in age senior citizens hallelujah I have a couple of friends who in their family there's been a condition in one case it is a heart condition and in this brother's life his father died at 43 his grandfather died at a similar age of the same condition another brother it's a cancer that has afflicted his family now when these brethren are reaching this age what do you think the devil does pure dart what do you think the dart say you almost 43 your daddy died at 43 is your house in order what is that heart murmur that you feel you don't feel your heart racing and fear takes over how many of you have had that experience you don't have to indicate but many of us it might be breast cancer running in your family you know or some other disease or sickness and when you reach a certain stage there's that dart of fear that fear that comes and you begin to write your funeral program one of these brothers told me this week that he wrote out his funeral program put it on computer and tell him why where to find it because he really was being bombarded with this obsession 
that boy in days number, them soon go. But how many of you know that the, ant the antidote to these attacks is confessing the word of God in faith? Amen. I shall live and not die to declare the works of God. Amen. God has not given us the spirit of fear, but the spirit of power and of love and of a sound mind. Amen. So when these things oppress us, these thoughts are bombarding us. We must recognize them for what they are, the fiery darts of the enemy. Once they land in our minds, you know, Satan just make the whole thing catch fire. And before you know it, you start seeing cancer and everything and hearing all the reports. The devil just work it out. CNN have a feature on genetics and cancer. And you just happen to see it just in time, you know. And everything just tie up and it just keep coming at you. You go to work and somebody say, boy, my cousin just died, you know. Why he died of? Don't tell me. Cancer. And, you know, and you just bombarded it left, right, and center. You know what I mean, brethren? But we resist by confessing the word of God in faith. Faith is the shield, the shield of faith, laying hold on the promises of God. When attacked by fear, by doubt, by depression, whatever it is. If it's depression, we need to talk to our souls, you know. One of my favorite psalms is Psalm 43. Boy, it's, it's, it's 42 and 43, both of them. It's hard to get depressed for me because, listen, when depression comes, I say, just as David said, and it's a secret, you know, brother, if you learn this, you're gone clear. You speak to your soul. What did David say? Why art thou cast down, O my soul? Why art thou disquieted within me? Hope thou in God, yet will I praise him who is the health of my countenance. You confess the word of God, amen? You talk to yourself. Don't let yourself talk to you. That's deep. Praise the Lord. You speak to yourself and you tell yourself, I am going to be happy today. It's a choice you make. Hello? I'm going to rejoice in the Lord. And I'm going to be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. And you allow the Lord to work in your life. The words of your mouth, very important. But the belief, the faith in your heart, believing what the word of God says, confessing it with your mouth, believing it, and having that cycle work in your life. Confess it with your mouth, believe it with your heart, confess it with your mouth, believe it with your heart, and your, your faith grows, and that shield is risen to extinguish the fiery darts of the wicked. Can you say amen? amen. Can you give the Lord a praise? Amen. Hallelujah. Then there's the helmet of salvation. What is the helmet of salvation? Mm -hmm. 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 8 says, the hope of salvation. Isaiah 59 says, God took the helmet of his salvation. The helmet of salvation speaks of the confident assurance that you have that you are saved. Hello? The confident assurance of God's salvation. Many of us don't have that confidence that we are saved. You know, when I got shot, one of the things that blessed me beyond imagination is the fact that I had absolutely no doubt whatsoever that I was on God's side and that I was, if I died, I would just see Jesus same time. No doubt. I never stopped to think, oh my God, am I really saved? Let me say the sinner's prayer one more time quick. Just in case. Not even a little doubt. There's something the Holy Spirit gives you called assurance. And that assurance, you see when the Bible talks about hope, you know, it's not wishful thinking like how we say, boy, I hope it rained today. The time hot. That's not what the Bible calls hope. The word hope in scripture means confident assurance that what you hope for is going to happen. Amen? That you have it. Not that you're guessing about it. Not that you wish you're going to get it. But that you have it. It's a confidence. It's an assurance that goes deep. The Bible says that the, the, the Lord knows them that are his. 
but them that are his knows that they are the Lord's. Because it says that if you have the Spirit of God, the Spirit bears witness with your spirit that you are a child of God. That assurance is something that you hold on to that protects you. It protects your head from confusion. It protects your head from doubt, unbelief, from all of these things that Satan would like to paralyze you with. Your thinking, your thinking process. That confidence, no, many of us, I know, don't have that confident assurance. Many of us get saved all three, four times. <laughs> also call you say, boy, maybe, maybe I need to make sure, you know, okay. And you go up again. You had a rough week, and boy, altar call give, and you say, boy, you know what? I'll just go up, yes. And you go up, and you get saved another time. Some of us want to get baptized all three, four times. But let me explain to you. Satan brings doubt and unbelief. When you commit your life to Jesus Christ, one of the ways that you know you're on the right track is when Satan comes to you and says, what did you do? You're not saved. You're just the same. Nothing will happen. You never have no fireworks go off. Nothing new. You never feel any different. When that happens to you, you know you're on the right track. <laughs> because, you see, what God wants is for us to believe his word and put our confidence in what he says. He says, if you believe in your heart that God has raised Jesus from the dead and you confess with your mouth, how are you going to? That Jesus Christ is Lord, you shall be saved. That's the word of God. So you hold on to the word of God, you confess the word of God, and you say, look, I don't feel saved, I don't look saved. Look in the mirror and you look the same way, in fact, you might look very lost. <laughs> but, based on the word of God, I remember when I just accepted Christ, I struggled with this lack of assurance for a long time. And many of us will. It, is, it, is, it happens to most of us. Am I not right? And then eventually, by confessing the word and laying hold on the word of God, the confidence comes into you, and you know that you are saved. If you lack this confidence, really press through to God. Get into the word. Convince yourself that your salvation is based on God's word, what God has said, and your faith in God's work. Amen? Not in your works. Not in your goodness. Not in your perfection, because when we say we're not turned perfect overnight, it's a process, amen? And even if you sin, the Bible says we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. It says if you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to, to forgive you of your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. So God wants us to have that assurance, that confidence, that hope that endures against all the opposition of Satan. God wants us to have that as a, as a helmet to protect us in the warfare. Our identity in Christ, our assurance of salvation. Your salvation is not based on work. It's not based on the fact that you love God plenty. Amen? It's based on the fact that you are saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. You have put your trust in Jesus. You have given him your life. You have asked him to cleanse you from your sin. You have confessed your sin. He has come into your heart, and you are a new creature. It is not based on feelings. It is based on the fact of God's word and God, what God says he will do. If he says he will save you when you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, when you submit to Jesus, when you believe in your heart that God had raised him from the dead, then you will be saved. Believe that. Hold on to that. Fight with that word. Amen? It will bring assurance. Then, finally, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. What is the sword of the Spirit, brethren? The Word of God. But what, what, how? I mean, the Word of God, the Bible. Do you swing the Bible in the air against the devil? The devil is not afraid of the Scriptures. You remember when Jesus was being tempted? Who quote Scripture? Satan. Satan can quote plenty of scripture, you know. You remember when Farrakhan was there and he gave that wonderful speech? 
Him quote scripture like, boy, I don't know, that man can quote scripture. Remember the Million Man March? The man quote scripture. You know, I don't think I remember him quoting the Quran even one time. Pure Bible. Pure Bible. I'm not calling him the devil, but you can make your inferences if you want. But he is, he is teaching deception. Very in, in a very inspiring and charismatic way. Satan is not afraid of quoting scripture. Understand that. Satan is not afraid of the Bible. Satan is one of the best theologians you can find. Hello? He knows the Bible. He knows it inside out. He knows it more than any of us could ever hope to know it. When he was tempting Jesus, he said, you know, it is written. And he quotes part of the scripture, leave out, conveniently leave out verses, and misapply the scripture. Trying to get Jesus to move out of God's will. The word of God is a sword. Interestingly, the word sword there doesn't refer to this long sword that we swing around. You know what it refers to? A dagger. I, I wonder to myself, why a dagger? Why didn't Paul use the word for the long sword? Why didn't he use the short sword? You know why? Because this battle is a hand-to-hand -hand combat. And when Satan reached up close, you don't have no space to swing the long sword. You have to have something that you can just use and has maximum mobility and you can trust into him. It is for when he come close. Because he does come close. Am I not right, brethren? But another thing I noticed that is that the word for the word of God is not logos that is normally used for scripture and so on. It's a word rhema. Rhema means the spoken word of God. It means the word that is declared. And it's, 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 it's referring to speech. Okay, this means two things. It means the word of God that he speaks to your heart. Not the word that you just read. So okay, we read the scriptures, but it has to come alive by the spirit. The Spirit of God has to speak it to our hearts. Have you ever been reading the scripture and it's like something just jump out at you? And you can identify with that word and it's like you grasp it and a light goes off. That is the rhema, that revelation word spoken by the Holy Spirit into your spirit. But it's also the rhema in the sense that you speak it by the Holy Spirit out to the devil. You declare the word of God, inspired of the Holy Spirit, anointed of the Holy Spirit. Amen? And that word is like a dagger right into Satan's heart. And so when Satan comes up close, you know you have the word of God, the living word. The word of God is living, it says in Hebrews 4 verse 12, active and powerful. We must know it. We must know how to apply it. We must be able to quote it. Amen? It must be, there must be a reservoir. You know, the Bible says, the Spirit of God will bring back to your memory all that I have spoken to you. Jesus said that to his disciples before he left. No, brethren, the Spirit of God will bring back to your memory the things that you have put in the memory bank. When you lick the computer, right? And you click on File, Receive. Right? It must be in RAM, not in RAM. Those of you who are computer people <coughs> will understand. It must be ready, accessed, available. Amen. Amen? It must be automatic that Satan comes at you and you can just come back at him, almost reflex in your sleep. The word of God says, and quote the scriptures with the anointing of the Holy Spirit. The rhema word, spoken, confessed, spoken into your heart by the Spirit of God and spoken by your spirit through your lips to the devil. Amen? To yourself too. But you declare God's word. It is alive, it is powerful, it is sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, joint and marrow. It can discern between the thoughts and the intents of the heart. It is only the living word of God can separate your motivations, you know, brethren. That word that God speaks to your heart sorts you out. 
And we're talking about God energizing the scriptures, using the scriptures and bringing the living word to discern the very intents of your own heart, your motivation that you can't even pick up by thinking with your mind. The spirit of God reveals by his word. Have you ever had a word that comes to you and it just turns on a light in your spirit and it just brings um, a revelation of what you were thinking that you never even you never were aware of it just gives you an understanding of your inner motivation that's the word of god the rhema of the spirit we must hunker for that you know brethren we must not be satisfied with just reading the word of god as we read a newspaper we must hunker for the living word where God speaks to you and you say, yes, I know God speaks to me. The word might be that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. But when that word hits you and it's a word energized by the spirit, it's not just God so loved the world that, you know, it's God so loved the world. It's like it catches your heart and it, 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 is, it is alive, it is powerful. It transforms you. It, it confronts your thought patterns. It transforms your, your mentality, the power of the word of God. Amen? As it comes into your heart, the rhema word. It's the sword of the spirit, the word of God. And then Paul says, interestingly, prayer. Prayer is not so much a weapon as the way that you, you fight generally. Prayer covers everything. You say, boy, you must pray at all times with all types of prayer, every type of prayer with all perseverance for all the saints. Prayer is a vital part of this warfare. It is how you put on the armor. It is how you walk. It is how you, you launch the weapons. It is how you swing the, the sword. Everything must be bathed in prayer. Amen? And we must pray for each other. Very often when we look at this passage, we think of individuals. But there's a corporate dimension. The shield of faith works best when the, the soldiers close ranks. Prayer is for all the saints. Amen? And we must pray for each other, cover each other. Pray for each other that we have the full armor of God and that we war effectively. Now, as we war in prayer, there are many different manifestations of prayer and there are many different ways that we exercise our warfare in fact there are several different weapons that we can't go into it today but if you look at our list on this handout you see that there are a number of things that are weapons of our warfare and the truth is that the holy spirit is the one as he fights for us he chooses the weapon to use at the appropriate time amen we have to yield to him he is the one who is commanding this thing. Look at some of the weapons. Submission, obedience to God. If we submit to God, we resist the devil, he will flee. That's a weapon. The blood of Jesus, they overcame by the blood of the Lamb and the, the word of their testimony. And they did not love their lives unto the death. Not loving our lives to the death is a weapon. The name of Jesus is a weapon. Praise is a weapon endurance is a weapon being faithful in doing good is a weapon loving our enemies is a weapon read romans 12. that, that one is interesting eh how you defeat your enemies very often it's by love and by the way we're talking about people here you don't love demonic spirits you can vex and quarrel and fight and chop up and stamp on demonic spirits all you want. You can have um, um, spiritual vengeance or retribution, anything you want when it comes to demonic spirits. But when it comes to people, what you must do? Thank you. Even your enemies. It says, you must do good to those that despitefully use you. Pray for those that persecute you. It says if your enemy hunger, what you must do? Starve him. If your enemy hunger, what you must do? If him thirst, what you must do? It's a powerful weapon, you know, brethren. At work, when your boss fighting against you and your co-workers slandering you, what you must do? 
slaughter them back. Bind them. You was buying them? Gillian said you was buying them. Bind the demons. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. Amen. Bind the demons. But love the people. Say it after me. Bind the demons. But love the people. Understand that we are never to hate anybody. You don't have that right. Bible says, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. It's talking about people here now. I don't care what they do you. You have no right to see them suffer and in pain and to say, yes, serve them right. Justice of God has prevailed. Vengeance of the Lord. The zeal of the Lord has performed it. See them get cancer. They are dead. Car accident is served them right. Who tell them to touch the Lord's anointed? We must never rejoice in the, in the fall of the wicked. I don't care how wicked the person is. We must say, God, have mercy on them. Amen? Bless them. Pray for them. We must pray for justice in our brethren. But pray for mercy when it comes to people. Pray that justice will be upheld. And that the principle of justice would rule. And that the satanic forces of, of injustice will be defeated. But when it comes to people, we must pray for their repentance and their salvation. Amen? So criminals, we must pray for them. Lord, forgive them. They do not know what they do. Have mercy on them. Save them. Grant that they would repent, Lord. That should be our spirit. Amen? When Stephen was being stoned by the, the Pharisees, Stephen looked up to heaven and he saw Jesus in glory. And he said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. When Jesus was on the cross, he said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. He didn't say, Lord, you see what they do? Yes, Lord. Judgment coming. Lord, judge them, Lord. Hello? Can you say amen, brethren? It's hard though, don't it? So the spirit of vengeance and aggression and militancy and so on must never be applied to people. When the Bible talks about us, about us turning the other cheek, we don't turn the other cheek to demons, you know. But when people box you upon your face, what the Bible says must do? Huh? Who said me? Who said that? You sure Jesus said that? Read your Bible, brethren. Jesus said, turn the other cheek. I know it means more than what it seems on the surface. And, you know, we could go into explaining what that means. But at least what it means is that we must not seek personal vindication and vengeance. We must not seek personal revenge. We must not seek to, to cause the person that hurts us to suffer because he hurt us or she hurt us. You understand? And it means that we must not be preoccupied with our own protection. In pursuing God's purpose, sometimes we have to make ourselves vulnerable to pain in our brethren. In pursuing God's purpose. Hello? What about suing? Somebody, well, praise the Lord. <laughs> That's a trick question. You know, sometimes you can sue them for their good. You want them to learn. Or you don't want them to hurt somebody else. But your attitude of heart must not be one where you want to get personal satisfaction from the pain of somebody else, even if they hurt you. No, I'm serious. Sometimes you have to do, take certain actions in order to protect other people. And in order to help that person to see their, their wrong. There's a place for punishment, you know. But what I'm saying is the attitude of heart must be that we always seek God's mercy on behalf of the person. When it comes to brethren in the church, the scripture says that we must settle disputes using the wisdom that God has provided. And we must never take a brother to court. Amen? Don't sue your brethren. Amen? 
You do business at Beckford's and boy, you get a bad deal and boy, you decide you're going to sue Brother Ray. Take it to the elders of the church first. Amen. Hallelujah. When they don't give you no satisfaction, take it to the Lord, sister. But your attitude is what is important. Are you following me, brethren? I know I'm opening up a whole can of worms, but I want you to think about this. It's your attitude. How do you reconcile these scriptures? How do you reconcile these things? It must be that Jesus is saying your attitude must be one where you are forgiving, where you show mercy, and that is a weapon against Satan. Showing mercy is a way that you fight spiritual warfare. Forgiveness is one of the most strongest and powerful weapons that you can employ. Forgiving others. You know what I notice about forgiveness? When I don't forgive somebody, it hurts me more spiritually than it hurts the person. So I'm not doing nothing towards that person. I'm hurting myself. Hence, Jesus said, forgive if you want to be forgiven. When you stand praying, forgive. If anyone has ought against you, forgive so that you will be forgiven by your Father in heaven. Am I speaking the word of God, brethren? You have to forgive. So unforgiveness is of the enemy. The enemy likes to use unforgiveness to sow bitterness in our hearts. So if we're struggling with unforgiveness, we're playing into the hands of Satan. We have to forgive others as a way of doing spiritual warfare. As you forgive others, as you bless those that curse you, listen to me, man, you neutralize spiritual dynamics that are arrayed against you. When somebody curses you in a brethren and you bless them in return, you neutralize the curse immediately. Hello? It's a spiritual principle. Bless and don't curse. From the same mouth can come blessing and cursing. And that's why, brethren, don't bother with the calling down curses on the prime minister and on the government and on the wicked man them. We curse the gunmen them. Who tell you must curse no gunman? Did we see that in the Bible? Huh? They didn't have gunmen in those days. Okay. I see. I see. I see. They didn't have gunmen in those days. I see. All right. We are not called to curse anybody. Hello? Nobody. We must pray for revival. We must pray for repentance. We must pray for God's mercy. Because those people, those wicked men, are already under the judgment of God, you know. God don't need you to curse them. They're already cursed. You understand? So your cursing don't make it, make God curse them no more. What they need is mercy. They need to find God. The worst of sinners need to repent and testify of the goodness and the mercy of God. And that's our prayer, that's our orientation. Leave the cursing, leave the vengeance to God, who is the judge. Him will take care of business. Vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. The context of that is that God is going to do it. It's not our business. We must love our enemies. We must do good to those that despitefully use us and, and, and fulfill the word of God. Reacting the right way. That's another weapon. Reacting the right, right way. Our reactions, you know, brethren, are very important. Sometimes we have some reflex reactions that we have to control. Somebody does something and you just tell them a bad word or cuss them off in another way. You don't use a bad word and you think, oh, well, I didn't sin. <laughs> or you do something, you know. Listen to me, brethren. Reactions. You must react the right way. Very often, the way to defeat the enemy is to react in the opposite spirit. Somebody come with contention and, and they, are, they are opposing you in some way to show them gentleness. Sometimes it's the way to just defeat the strategy of the enemy. And we could go on and go on. Then there is setting captives free, direct confrontation with the demonized. Then there is fasting. Giving is a powerful weapon as well. Give to the Lord. You know, the scripture says in Luke chapter 6, 38, give 
and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, shall men pour into your bosom. I believe that's a spiritual principle, a tremendous and powerful spiritual principle. When you give to the Lord, it did not say if you give money, the Lord will give you back money, you know. And that's where a lot of people go wrong. It said, give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over, shall men pour into your bosom. I think it means as you give to the Lord, you put yourself in a position to receive the blessings of God. You might give to the Lord money and he give you back good health. Hello? Which is better, better than money. Yeah? You might give to the Lord your time and he gives you back peace. Money. Why are you brethren on a roll today? Yes. Gives you back money. Nothing wrong with that. See? The Lord can give you back money, right? You give to the Lord, and as you give, giving is a, there's a, an attitude of gratitude from which you give. And when you give with that attitude of gratitude, you open up yourself to receiving from the Lord. Some of us, we don't receive the blessings of God because we're so tight, stingy. Eh? Stingy, a stingy spirit, a mean spirit, a greedy spirit, a get spirit. The Bible says it's more blessed to what? Give than to receive. As you give, a, the spiritual dynamics are put into motion that enables you to receive the blessing of God. I believe it with all my heart. I've seen it over and over in my experience. Anytime I'm in a, a crisis financially, I start to give because it always works that that giving frees me up to receive from the Lord. It does something to my, my ability to receive from the Lord. When I'm in a crisis in terms of circumstances, I find a way to give. And as I give, the way is opened up for me to receive deliverance and blessing. You might say, but Pastor all that sounds like you're giving to receive. Not really, you know. A giving out of an attitude of gratitude to God. But I also give with the knowledge that as I give, the Lord is no man's debtor. And the Lord has promised. It's Jesus who said, give and it shall be given unto you. So I expect that God is going to bless me when I give. I look for it. He might not bless me materially because I give materially. But some blessing is in store. I know it because it's the word of God. Amen. Give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over. Will men pour into your bosom. God will use men, donkey, anything he wants to use to bless you. Amen. Unity and agreement. Not a powerful weapon. Displaying the opposite spirit. Another powerful, powerful weapon. For example, if there is a spirit of strife and contention, you must be seeking God for a spirit of reconciliation and peace. If there is a spirit of greed, you defeat the spirit of greed by encouraging a spirit of generosity. Amen? The opposite spirit. And it's very important that we identify the spirits that are dominant in our nation. What are some of those spirits? Tell me some. Violence. Hostility. Aggression. Any of you ever see some of you drive on the road? I won't call any names. Look straight at me, brethren. Don't look at Don't look guilty. But some of you drive bad. You have yielded to the spirit of hostility and aggression that prevails on the road. But you say, but if I don't drive like that, I'm going to crash. Because they say you must drive defensively. But some of you is not no defensive driving. That's very offensive driving. How you drive on the road, you can catch the spirit of the taxi man them and the bus drivers and drive accordingly. Some of you, you never give a person a pass yet. You're driving on the road. You never stop and make somebody pass. You go so close to the next man bumper, you're not making nobody bore. It's a spirit. It's a spirit. 
I was driving with brother Larry recently. I hope he's not here. But Larry's a good driver. He gives people pass and things. Um, he was letting through some people. I noticed people behind him blowing, you know. So I said, what happened to this man here? He must say, boy, you know, he didn't give people drive, space. No. It's a spirit. And we must counteract that spirit. Amen? Drive carefully, you know, brethren. And drive defensively, whatever that means. But don't give in to that spirit of aggression and meanness that you see people displaying on the road. That cutthroat spirit. And some of we are Christian, but boy, when we're on the road, it's like... <clears throat> and somebody bad drive us, and if you ever hear the things that come out of our mouth, how I know this? Revelation, revelation, leave it at that. <laughs> revelation, ready. Praise the Lord, we have to close now. But I want to take us to a point where we commit ourselves to resist evil as it's manifested through these principalities and powers that are arrayed against us. In preparing this message, the Holy Spirit said to me, if it's one thing that I must highlight today, it is the attack of the enemy against families. Satan attacks the structures that God has instituted to protect us. The structures like government. Government is God's idea. But Satan has attacked government to bring us bad government, absent government, and rebellious government, rebellious against God. God has instituted the family. The family is an institution created by God to protect us. Marriage is a blessed institution. Amen? So Satan attacks marriage. Satan attacks fatherhood. He attacks motherhood. He tries to destroy the family. I want us today to take a stand against the attacks against our families. I'm not leaving out the singles. We're going to come to you another time. Amen? Don't feel no way. But today, this morning, I want us to pray about family life. I want to ask the couples among us to stand for me, and then we are all going to pray for you as we close this meeting. All the couples. Single parents as well. Couples and single parents, please stand. We're not. We're in family. We need to pray also for the Rochester family. All of them are sick, we understand. If it's not bronchitis, it's pneumonia or some other thing. So we need to pray especially for them today. Why are we praying for families? Satan attacks families. And in Jamaica, there is a, a ruling spirit that is assigned to destroying families. It must be. If you look at the pattern, it is kind of obvious. Family structure, parenthood, motherhood, fatherhood, all of those things are being attacked viciously by the devil. Marriage. We want to just pray for each other at this time. That God would preserve the family life in our midst and in our nation. That God would have mercy, give us grace and strategy to overcome. The Lord told me this morning, and I, I, sometimes I don't say the Lord tell me, but the Lord tell me, say all of us who married must pray with our wives. Keep your face straight, but let me tell you, most of us in here, this is revelation. Do not pray with our spouse. You know why? Because the devil puts all kind of little obstacles. It is the hardest thing. I've counseled with people and I hear it is one of the hardest things. You go to prayer and boy, you have a little fuss and you don't feel comfortable praying together. You don't feel comfortable opening up your heart to God together. It is an attack of the devil. Hello? It's a spirit. 
because Satan knows that the most powerful weapon in the family is a praying husband and wife team. And so we have to counter that. And I want us to make a commitment. Some of us used to pray and have devotions with our spouse. Family devotions is fine, but we need to pray with our spouse. I know for me, over the years, this has been one of the hardest struggles because Satan just keeps attacking it. And you know, your little, little excuses, you just always find some little excuse why you don't pray together. But God is saying he wants us to make that commitment. This is part of obeying God now. That we pray together as a couple in addition to our family times of devotion with the children. Amen? That we share from the word together. Can we make that commitment? I'm prepared to make that commitment again today and to continue that fight. And we have to help each other, you know, brethren. Because you'll make the commitment and it will run for a week. Then the following week you're so busy and your schedules don't match. Some of you, I don't know how you even have children. <laughs> because you are so busy. How it happens, I don't know. No, I, I, you all laugh, but I know, what I know what I'm talking about. It's like ships passing in the night. And they collide every now and then. Meet by accident. Let's pray for the parents among us. The single parents have a difficult task. You know, you have, you have some of you who are aunties that are really parents and you're not standing. You need to stand, you know, because God has given you a responsibility to, to bring up children. You might be an auntie and you have children under your, uh, your charge. God wants you to recognize that you need to function as a parent. You have been, but you need to really claim it, receive it, and pray about your responsibility before God. Take it seriously. Let us pray. Father in heaven, almighty God, we thank you for your grace. Thank you for your word, O oh God. We pray that as your people, Lord, we'll be fully clothed with the full armor of God. Lord, that we might be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Lord God, we pray that each of us who are struggling with besetting sins and the attacks of the enemy, and Lord, being just taken over by the spirit of the age, that we might be given grace by your word, Lord, to resist the attacks of the enemy and to overcome, O oh God. Lord, we pray that, Lord, in particular, family life will be preserved in our midst and in this nation, O oh God. Lord, raise up a standard against the onslaught of the devil to destroy the concept of parenthood, motherhood, fatherhood. Lord God, marriage, family life in our country, Lord, is in, in shambles. Lord, we pray for those of us standing here this morning that, Lord God, we would take a stand against the prevailing spirit of the age, the spirit of adultery, unfaithfulness, irresponsibility, abdication of, of responsibility, the, the, the spirit which causes fathers to lay back and let the woman, women run the spiritual life of the family. The spirit that causes fathers not to take responsibility to parent their children. Lord God, we pray that you give us the grace to seek you together as couples. That Lord, we might pray before you, Lord. Seek you consistently, Lord. And that we might do warfare together and cover each other, seeking your face together in un unity, O oh God. Lord God, we pray for those who are single parents that you give them special grace, that, Lord, they would just discharge their responsibility before you, that, Lord, you would use them, O oh God, to uphold family life, that they would not, Lord, be behind in terms of this, this scriptural principle, that, Lord, the body of Christ would make up for any deficiencies that they have, and together, Lord, we might close ranks against the enemy, and that, Lord, we might do damage to the kingdom of darkness, that, Lord, we might bring up godly children who know you and love you, who have values, Lord, and who have a worldview that is of the word of God. Oh, God, we pray for grace that we might be effective godly parents, that, Lord, we might nurture our children in the fear and admonition of the Lord. We pray, Lord, against those families that are under intense spiritual attack. We pray, Lord, for those that are being tempted, Lord, to 
to, be, to grow cold in their love for each other and tempted to, to go apart from each other and tempted to, to get involved in inappropriate affection with other people outside of their relationship. Lord God, we pray for grace and deliverance and victory, O oh God. Lord, we pray against the issues of midlife. Lord, the crisis that some people feel must happen. Lord God, we pray that the crisis will be turned, Lord God, into opportunity, Lord, to declare your goodness, to prove your faithfulness, to overcome, to take our marriages to a higher level, Lord, to take our relationships to a deeper depth, Lord God, to bring glory to your name. Lord God, bless each and every one of us, Lord, and bless our family life, we pray, in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Let's give the Lord a praise, brethren. Hallelujah. Let's praise the Lord for victory. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. We didn't, we didn't pray for the Rochesters, and we're going to do that now.